going to come and share the word with us. And just uh, most of you know, but Elias is uh, with us as a part-time intern uh, for this. We started in September, so we've had about four months or so together of doing a, a number of uh, pastoral type things. Uh, probably one of my favorite uh, things th that I've enjoyed thus far working with Elias is the times of prayer that we spend together, uh, just uh, lifting up our church family and, and various things that way, and so it's been sweet. But uh, this morning we get to hear from the Word, and so Elias, would you come and share? I'll have to apologize ahead of time. My voice is only at 50% this morning, so. Yep, yeah, they might have to turn me up in the back. <laughs> All right, let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you that we can just come into your house this morning and I just worship you. Thank you for um, just the worship team and just how they led us. Um, just thinking about how worthy you are. Praise, Lord. You are the king of creation. And I just thank you that we can come together as a family and, and just lift up your name, Lord. You are worthy of all praise. I just ask that as we spend time in your word that you would be glorified and that um, your name would be great. And I just ask that, that you would speak to us through your word, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so Pastor Peter and I um, have been working on this series of the glory of God. And so last week, um, we looked in, in Exodus 33 at the close and personal aspect of God's glory revealed to Moses. Um, Pastor Peter defines glory as the weightiness of the Lord's character, his worth and his goodness. Um, he was revealed as the almighty God who shows grace and compassion to us. He revealed himself to Moses as a great and yet personal God. And um, we ended by looking at how Christ is, is the ultimate revelation of that to us. He, he revealed himself to us most fully through Christ. So this week, um, we're going to get a small glimpse into the glory of God as the Lord and Redeemer of all creation, the King and the Lamb. And so we're going to be reading from Revelation 4 and 5. And just for context, um, about 60 years after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, um, he revealed himself to the Apostle John, um, just giving him a glimpse into the perfect will of God for his creation. And, and that's what we find in the book of Revelation, it's, and it's accounts of these visions. Um, and so as we're, as we're reading through this and interpreting it, um, we have to keep in mind that like, um, with this type of literature, most of these visions are very literal, but there will also be some symbolism that illustrates deeper theological concepts that might otherwise not be obvious, but we'll get to that um, when, when we come across that. Um, so leading up to chapter four, Jesus had just given John the messages to the seven churches in Asia Minor, and um, just urging them to look to Christ as their king and their redeemer, to be able to overcome the trials and temptations and the persecution that, that they were facing. And now we come to chapter four, which is a description of the glorious throne room of the king of creation, who is worthy of all worship. Um, let's, so let's read together uh, Revelation chapter four, uh, verses one to seven. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, come up here, and I will show you what m must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones, I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. Out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion, and the second creature like a calf, and the third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. 
so we have this, this incredible description of, of the throne room, the throne room of God. And, and we see him as the king of the heavens and the earth. And he's so glorious and magnificent. We have this, this powerful description that can really just get a sense of awe of how beautiful and, and mighty our God is as he's sitting sovereignly on his throne, surrounded by these noble elders and these fascinating creatures. Um, so let's just take a moment to, to like highlight some of these things. So in verse 1, we see um, John hears this, this mighty voice, this voice that had like a sound of a trumpet speaking with him, saying, come up here, and I will show you what may ta- must take place after these things. Um, in verse 2, he sees the throne and the one seated upon him. That is the focus. Um, in verse 3, it describes all these beautiful, brilliant colors and, and, and lights. Um, this, the one who is seated on the throne is like Jasper and, and Sardius or, or Carnelian, which is like a, a beautiful, like fiery colored precious stone with like smooth bands running through them. So like he just notices this color and there's this emerald green rainbow or, or radiance of light just surrounding the throne. Um, in verse 4, we see that... Um, Around the, the Lord's throne are, are these smaller thrones with, with 24 elders. It's like a, like a royal court, and, and they're worshiping him. Um, in verse 5, we notice flashes of lightning and, and rumblings and peals of thunder. Just like when God came to Moses on Mount Sinai, that was, that was something that, that came with that, um, just the whole earth trembling at the glory of God. Um, we also notice these these. Flames of brilliant fire representing the omniscient Holy Spirit in verse 5. In verse 6, there's this this sea of glass that's like crystal. And it would just be reflecting all of this light and all this glory that John is seeing. It would just be reflecting that. And then we see these these fascinating creatures who are are constantly before the throne worshiping God. Um, And we could spend all morning just being in awe of this scene and just filled with wonder. But God's glory is not just limited to what we're seeing and hearing here. This was simply an outward expression of of his greatness, not just the source. It was was not the source of the glory itself. And so it was just like the natural outflow of the abundance of his glory. Um, I was trying to think of an illustration to kind of like understand that better. And like the most glorious thing that I could think of was freshly baked bread. (laughs) It's a very earthly type of glory. <laughs> Nothing like this. But if you think about this for a second, when bread is baking, there's this beautiful smell that I absolutely love. And, and I, I'm just always like enjoying just that, that aroma that's coming from the oven as it's baking. But the smell itself isn't what I'm the most excited about. It's the source of that smell, the, the fresh bread itself. And so just like... The, the aroma of fresh bread draws us to the finished product. All of these like sights and this amazing like color and, and this incredible scene is meant to point us to the, the source of the glory. The king of creation, the one who is worthy of worship. These, these four living creatures direct our attention to the source of this magnificent which is the character and nature of God. Look at verse 8. It says, And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, To him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created. God's holiness is the central aspect of their worship. It's the thing that they point out first and foremost. He is above all. He is pure and divinely set apart. Notice how they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. 
Um, in, in Semitic languages, when, when a word is repeated like this, it's, it's intensifying um, the degree of, of that word that's being used. And so using it three times in a row is, is really emphasizing how holy is, is the Lord. He is the perfection of holiness. He is pure, perfect, and divine. He is high and set apart from anything else. He is holy. He is the almighty God who was and who is and who is to come. He is infinite, unchanging, eternal. He's sovereign. He's outside of all boundaries like time and space. He is the holy Lord God, the almighty, who was and is and is to come. The past and present and future all are revolving around him. And he is the almighty king over everything. And so that's what, that's what this, this worship in the throne room is, is focused around, is how great this, this king is. And notice how when they give glory to him and honor and thanks, verse 9, which, which we're told that they're doing unceasingly, continually before the throne, then the elders fall down and worship. They cast their golden crowns before the throne because they know that only the Lord is worthy of that kind of honor. He is so much greater than anything or anyone else. In verse 11, we see them saying that our Lord and our God is worthy to receive glory and honor and power. He is the creator of all things, the purpose of all things. Through his will, all things exist. The whole earth was created to point to God's glory. He is the glorious king of creation. That is who he is. So the sovereign and holy king of all creation is worthy of worship because of his glorious character. The sovereign and holy king of creation is worthy of all worship because of his glorious character. Because of who he is. Isaiah 6 is another passage that, that describes um, just the Lord on his throne. And in it, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him. And these seraphim are, are then described in a very similar way as, as the four living beasts here. Um, and one of them cried out, or called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. This is who our God is. The sovereign and holy king of all creation is worthy of worship because of his glorious character. This takes us to chapter 5. And not only do we see God as the holy king of creation, but also as the redeeming lamb who is worthy of worship. So 5 verse 1 says, I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. John is greatly weeping, or some translations say loudly weeping, because there's no one who is worthy. What is the significance of this scroll? What, it, what is the big deal? Well, we find out in, in the later chapters that this scroll contains the directions for the fulfillment of God's plan for creation. These are his directions for performing his holy justice on his creation. And so who is worthy of opening this except the heir of creation himself? And no one met that title. No one could fill that role as the heir. And so John is greatly weeping. But look at what verse 5 says. And one of the elders said to me, Stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. 
the Lion of Judah is worthy. This, this reference to the Lion of Judah comes from Genesis 49, verses 9 to 12, which is um, Jacob giving a blessing to his sons. And, and in that blessing was this prophecy that the Lion of Judah would come, a descendant of Judah, who would be a, a sovereign king. And so they, Israel have been waiting for this, this king <laughs> for several thousand years. Um, and then we see uh, the root of David. This is a reference back to the Davidic covenant where God promises that from David's line there would be an everlasting ruler who would always be on the throne. Um, Isaiah 11 also talks about the root of Jesse, which is David's father, um, and speaks of this everlasting and righteous ruler. So this is the one who is worthy of opening the book. And so John looks now to see this Lion of Judah, this, this king that is the root of David. What does he see? Well, verse 6 says, And I saw between the throne, this literally in the midst of the throne, and the four living creatures, and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He sees a lamb, the humble king slain for us. I, I missed Sunday school this morning, but I appreciated what Andrew shared just of, of how in like Philippians, that's, that's how Christ is presented as he, he humbled himself to, the, to become part of his creation and, and to be obedient to the point of death. John here sees Jesus Christ, the son of the most high, the heir of creation. Um, here's where we see some of this, the symbolism in, in the imagery um, where Christ is portrayed as the lamb having seven horns. Um, and um, a horn represented power and strength um, throughout prophecy and, and the Old Testament, just in, in the writings, we see that uh, come up quite often. Uh, so the, the horn represents power and strength. And there's seven of these. Seven is the number representing like, like fullness and perfection, completion. And so here we see the lamb as perfect in power and strength. And then the seven eyes represent his perfect omniscience. And, and that's, uh, we're told here that these are the seven spirits of God in verse six, sent out into all the earth. Um, so, so we see Christ's perfect omniscience there. He sees all things and is powerful and sovereign over them. In the verses seven to 10 read, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign on the earth. The lamb is worthy to take the book because of his work, because of who he is. He not only created the earth, but his work has redeemed it. Let's just take a second to, to think about the significance of this. So we saw the king of glory and a God who is holy. All creation was created for him and through him. He is the one who is worthy of our worship, our thanks, our lives, Simply because of who he is, the king of creation is worthy of worship. And yet, we rebelled against him by choosing to sin and disobey him. We, we chose to sin against him, the king of glory. We chose to live for our glory and to make our lives about what we want. We essentially claim to know better than the unchanging, omniscient, almighty God. Romans 3 tells us that we have fallen short of the glory of God. We have missed the mark and we broke the relationship that we had with God. We committed sin. It's treason against the king of creation. We are not worthy of glory, but of eternal separation and death. Ephesians 2, verses 3 to 7 says that we were by nature children of wrath, but God being rich in mercy 
because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. The Lion of Judah, the Root of David, our King, set aside the perfect expression of his glory to become the Lamb to be slain. A Lamb is an animal that was often referred to or used to refer to weakness and helplessness. So the king of glory became, made himself weak. The lamb of glory became a man so that he could pay the price that we owed. He suffered and died on our behalf. He paid for our sins and redeemed us. So Revelation 5 Verses 9 to 10. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. How undeserving of that we are. He mentions that that not only has he redeemed us, but he's made us to be a kingdom and priests to our God. A priest is someone who has a relationship with the Lord. <laughs> we have a relationship with the God that we sinned against. Not only that, but it says that we will reign with him upon the earth. <laughs> he is so, so good to us. Um, the life that we live now is, is Christ's life. And he, decide, he decided that he wants to share his rule with us. Romans 8, verse 17 tells us that we have been adopted as children of God, and as his children, we are fellow heirs with Christ. Isn't that amazing? It says that they will reign with him, the lamb, the pure, spotless one, who set aside his full expression of his glory and, and gave his life to redeem us and reconcile us into our relationship with the king of kings. He is worthy of worship. He is worthy of glory. He is the rightful heir of creation. The Lamb of glory is worthy of all worship and power because he is the creator and redeemer of all. In Colossians 1, 16 to 20, says, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for the fullness to dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven, so the, creator, the king of creation is worthy of all worship because of who he is, and the redeeming lamb is worthy of all worship because of what he has done. And this takes us to the pinnacle of the worship that we see in this passage. Revelation 5, verses 11 to 12. It says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. It's just an unimaginable number. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. We see, first of all, the entire heavenly realm has declared the redeeming Lamb as the sovereign King of glory. And then, joining with them, with all of heaven 
You have all of creation, every created thing. It says, which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them. He's talking about literally everything. The heavens and all its galaxies filled with stars and the earth with like the great elephants to the bears and the deer to like the smallest newts and shrews, the great eagles in the sky and, and, and cranes to delicate butterflies and iridescent beetles to the great blue whales in the sea to jellyfish to the smallest protozoa. Like, just look outside at like all the trees and just the magnificence of that to like the smallest microscopic like microbes and like the vast fungal networks underground. All of creation is joyfully declaring his glory with one harmonious voice. And they say, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying amen, giving their, their strong affirmation, joining in with the worship. And once again, the elders fell down and worshipped. All creation exists for our Lord. It's all about him. He is the king of creation, the redeeming lamb, the almighty God of glory. He is worthy of all worship. So all creation will declare his glory. This is how they're worshipping. What are we doing? As a redeemed child of God, does my life declare his glory? Does my life point to how great God is? Or am I still trying to show the world how great I am? You know, the elders here, they're, they're falling down. There's such humility. And so who do I think I am? Does every part of me long to praise God? And as the earth beneath me and the, the air that I'm breathing is declaring Christ as king, Am I really going to try to be the king of my own life? Like, I do that almost every day. I, I want to live for myself and do what I want because I want to get what I think I deserve. And because we're still sinners, we will not set aside our own futile glory except for when we are in absolute awe of God's true glory. And so let's remind each other of that. Just all glory belongs to the king and to the lamb. So in closing, I'm going to read Romans 11, verse 33 to 12, verse 2. I would encourage you this week to go and, and read through that, all of chapter 12. And there's just some great application in there. Um, Romans 11, starting in verse 33. It says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Ooh. Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So as God's redeemed children, let's live holy lives, set apart for our King and for the Lamb. Let us live for His glory. Let us worship Him with every breath that we have. And let us look to Him as our King. Let us resist temptation of sin because our God is worthy of our whole being, all of our worship. Let our lives declare the glory of our King and of the Lamb. The King of creation and the redeeming Lamb is worthy of all worship. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we come before you just with humility and just with wonder of who you are, God. You are worthy of all glory. God, thank you for redeeming us. 
Thank you for humbling yourself and just coming to live among us so that you could die in our place, God, that you could pay for the, the sins that we committed against you. Lord, thank you that we can have new life in you and that we can have a relationship with you. We are so unworthy of that. God, I ask that you would help us to bring you glory with every aspect of our lives, God. That there would be nothing in our lives that we would hold on to for the purpose of, of magnifying ourselves, Lord. Only you are worthy of worship, God. And so I just ask that that you would help us to, to deny ourselves, to die to self, God, and to live for you, to live holy lives for you, God. May you be glorified through us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.